This podcast is for mature audiences. It contains graphic violence and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Realm presents Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Episode 8. 1851, Murphy's Diggings, California. Amidst debate over the rights of racial minorities and women across the United States, Virginia closes its Reform Constitutional Convention, granting all white men in the state the right to vote. Marshal Jacob Schmidt's place above the town jail was nothing to brag about, but it came free with the badge, which I learned had come as a reward for his part in hanging my brother. It seemed the town's fathers thought Schmidt had the right attitude when it came to greasers. I had a different reward in mind. When he stumbled home this night, it was obvious he'd been drinking. He was through the door and inside the apartment before he registered that he was not alone. I sat at a rough wooden table with both barrels of a shotgun pointing at him. Remember me? Schmidt stopped just inside the door. He bumped it with his rear and it swung close, startling him and pitching the room into near darkness with only one window letting in a little moonlight. He managed, but got no further than that. Light! Valenzuela, lurking in the dark, struck a match and touched it to a candle, which he set on the table in front of me. I wore all black, at least as far as Schmidt could see. My hat was pulled low over my brow. Schmidt gawked at me, as though trying to place my face. His gaze darted briefly toward Valenzuela, who remained shrouded in shadow. Think back. You hanged my brother. Recognition dawned in his eyes. You're him. You stole Lang's meal. I did nothing of the sort, as I think you know. And neither did my brother. I'm sure you know that too. My voice was as calm as if we were having a neighborly chat. My hands were steady too, as were those barrels pointed his way. Look, mister. All I know is that was Will's meal, and he got it back. I got no quarrel with you. I think you do, or at least I have a quarrel with you. Your fights with Lang, not me. A newspaper rattled in his hand, and he threw it down on the table just to be rid of it. His obvious peril appeared to have sobered him up fast. He had a pistol at his hip. But if he reached for it, I could open it up with those barrels and cut him in half. I don't want any part of it. You made yourself part of it. I saw nobody forcing you. So, so you're here to kill me? That's the general idea, but not so quickly. If not for you, my brother would still be alive. I feel you should suffer first before you die give you time to dwell on your sins. Faced with slow death by torture, Schmidt chose action over surrender. He dropped abruptly to the floor, landing hard on the planks. My shotgun went off, its roar deafening in the little space, but it was still aimed at where Schmidt had been. My shot tore into the wall behind him. Schmidt grabbed a leg on the table and shoved it toward me. The candle flew off the table, bouncing off me, and went out before it hit the floor. Valenzuela cursed, but howled his fire, no doubt reluctant to shoot in the dark. Schmidt moved quickly, yanking out his gun with his right hand and wrapping his left hand around the chair leg as he pushed to his feet. Without slowing, he hurled the chair and it crashed into me slowing me down. He snapped off two quick shots at where he thought Valenzuela was and raced for the bedroom. Valenzuela and I followed. As Schmidt threw the bedroom window open, he fired twice more back through the doorway into the front room to discourage pursuit. 
Despite his bulk, he managed to squeeze out the window, only to be grabbed by a pair of powerful hands that tugged him through the gap and onto the pitched roof where Tres Dedos was waiting. Through the window, I saw what happened next. Schmidt fell, sprawling onto the roof. He lost his grip on the pistol and it slid toward the edge. But Tres Dedos' booted foot halted its descent. My cousin stood before him, lined by moonlight. He looked as big and solid as Schmidt himself. In his right hand, he held a long knife that put me in mind of a pirate's cutlass. Tres Dedos grinned. Going somewhere, my friend. Schmidt slowly got to his feet and jerked a thumb toward the window. He looked hopefully at my cousin, as though desperately seeking an ally. Men in there, trying to kill me. You don't say. They all, my gun. Oh, this is yours. With the quick motion of his foot, Tres Dedos skidded the gun behind him and over the edge. At the same instant, he lunged forward, driving that wide, curved blade into Schmidt's gut. He yanked it free again, and blood splashed the roof. Schmidt dropped to his knees, hands across his midsection, trying to hold himself together. At the last moment, though, he must have realized his mistake because he had just put his throat within reach of the attacker. Moonlight glinted off the blade as Tres Dedos drew it back and slashed toward him. Schmidt's head slapped the roof before his body did. I wanted him alive. I told Tres Dedos watching from the window as my cousin finished the job of sawing off Schmidt's head. Blood ran in rivulets to the edge of the roof and spattered on the ground below. Tres Dedos shrugged. So you did. But when I heard the shotgun, I figured you'd change your mind. Well, oh, he didn't cooperate. Does that surprise you? Hazlo rápido. People will have heard the shots. They'll be here any moment. This is my vengeance too, Joaquin. Jesus was your brother, but he was my cousin and my best friend. I owe these bastards a debt. Tres Dedos finished his grisly work and raised his head high. Ya está. Toss it into the street, right in the middle, where no one can miss it. Tres Dedos lobbed the head over the edge of the roof. It arced out and dropped into the center of the road. Vámonos, ahora, rápido! Tres Dedos took a last, long look at the corpse and the river of the blood flowing from it, then hurried to the window. Valenzuela and I helped him through the opening and we rushed back toward the door. On the way out, I spied the newspaper Schmidt had dropped. Moonlight revealed a bold headline across the top saying, Mill payrolls robbed in deadly ambush. I snatched it up and together we raced for our horses waiting at the side of the building. We hadn't gone far before we heard the screams of whoever had first happened upon Schmidt's head. Back at our camp, I read the newspaper article by the light of the campfire. More Mexican murderers. On the third, Saturday, a cowardly ambush along the trail to Sawmill Flat left 11 American payroll guards dead and one gravely injured. The sole survivor, one Joseph Farmer, a payroll guard in the employ of the San Francisco Savings Bank located on Montgomery Street in that fair city, reports that the murderers laid in wait then caused an explosion that created a hole beneath the first of the two wagons carrying payroll funds for the primarily Mexican employees of the two sawmills. 
In the confusion caused by the explosion, the murderers opened fire upon the guards, who fought back bravely, but were outnumbered. All of the killers were Mexican, Farmer describes, and seemed to be led by one called Joaquin, who Farmer says was short, stout fellow with, with more gold in his mouth than ivory. Several men called out the name of Joaquin, who provided medical aid that allowed Farmer to live when all others had died. As a further atrocity, one of the killers beheaded a man. That murderer had only three fingers on his right hand and is believed to be the outlaw known as Three Finger Jack. At that, I hurled the paper to the ground. Damn you to hell, Valenzuela. Valenzuela looked at me with questioning eyes. What did I do? This newspaper thinks you were the leader of the attack on the payroll wagons. Me? Why? It says everybody was calling for Joaquin and you helped them bind the survivor's wounds. So he thinks you're the Joaquin everybody looked to for orders. Wow, that's not my fault. He was right. It wasn't his doing. And the realization calmed my anger somewhat. Raising my voice, I announced to my men that from now, we would speak English whenever we were around Americans. Tres Dedos frowned. He was sitting cross-legged on the other side of the fire with a jug between his thighs. Always. Unless we're addressing someone who doesn't speak English or we're in Mexico. There, we're not bandits. In America, we are. And American bandits speak English. Tres Dedos came over to sit beside me. This troubles you. I lowered my voice. This was one of the lessons of leadership. I thought, don't display weakness, even perfectly human weakness, in front of your men. It does. Perhaps it shouldn't. Pride is one of the deadly sins after all. But damn it, that wasn't Valenzuela's plan. It was mine. And it worked. It paid off handsomely. That it did, Joaquin. And the men know it was yours. Even if that newspaper is ignorant, they all look up to you. It wasn't the newspaper. It was the man I told you to spare. He misunderstood the situation and described Valenzuela as the leader. Now the whole world thinks it. <laughs> I'm sure the whole world doesn't read this. You're right. Of course, cousin. I'm overreacting. It shouldn't matter to me. But it does. You want to be famous. I don't care about fame. But I want to be feared. I want other Americans to think twice before laying a hand on an innocent Mexicano. That's a noble goal. Tres Dedos leaned forward, pulled a stick from the fire, and lit a cigar from it. Sparks drifted into the air. I do have another task to perform before we leave Murphy's, but it will be a pleasant one for a change. Can I help? No. This one I should do alone. It won't take long. I'll leave at first light, and I'll be back before noon. True to my word, I left the camp on horseback before the sun broke the horizon. An hour later, I was knocking at the door of Bernardo Alvarado, who had told me where his farm was before we rode off to bury Jesus in the wilderness. Bernardo came to the door. He looked older than I had remembered, unshaven and haggard. He held a mug of coffee in one hand. His eyes brightened when he saw me. It's you! I told you I would return. I held out a sack of money from the payroll job. It was a mixture of American eagles and double eagles, Mexican pesos, Spanish reals, and the blooms, and in exchange notes from the San Francisco bank. What's this? I told you I repay your friend tenfold for the horse. A good animal she turned out to be too. I'm still riding her. I gestured over my shoulder toward where the mare waited at the gate. This is probably more than tenfold, but your friend deserves it. I thank you, sir. He'll be delighted. He never expected payment. 
Tell him that Joaquin Murieta always pays his debts. July 1851, Central Valley, California. High summer. I had killed eight of the men from the mob that had lynched my brother. Six had left the area for parts unknown, and more than those I couldn't identify with enough certainty. I had shot the narrow-faced man who murdered my friend and partner Bill right between the eyes. The task accomplished, my friends and I had turned our attention to higher goals. Over time, we added to our rank. Some of the men who joined us were outlaws. Others had failed at mining or lost other jobs. Most were desperate for one thing or another or hadn't found what they were looking for. Or, like me, had found it and seen it taken away simply because they were Mexicanos. Soon, We were 30 men strong and all answered to me. I set few rules, but for most among them was that Mexican people were to be treated with respect at all times. Those in need were to be helped if at all possible. Anytime a robbery was profitable, a percentage of the take would be handed out to the poor Mexicanos or those in debt to the Americans. In this way, we would make sure that we were always welcome in Mexicano neighborhoods and homes. Our own people would shield us from American law when necessary, hide us when pursued, and inform us of riches for the taking. One hot afternoon in the Southlands, Tres Dedos and I and a few others were riding around the perimeter of a wealthy ranch. Grazing behind fences were 70 or 80 of the finest horses I had ever seen. We could sell those for a fortune, up north, or in Sonora, either one. If we sold them for half their value, we'd still be rich. Tres Dedos laughed. I loved the sound he made when he did that, deep and gravelly. It made me think of the devil clearing his throat. (laughs) You're right. And they're right for the taking. I don't see anyone tending to them. But we don't have room at our hideout for that many. Where will we hide them until we could sell them? I might have an idea about that. I was talking to one of the new men, Raiz Carrillo, and he told me of the place that might suit us better. Tell me, it's near Arroyo de Cantua, a canyon easily defended with grassy pasture lands. There's always water running through the arroyo. The walls are steep hard to climb, and there's only one way in and out. I tried to picture the area. Arroyo de Cantua was in the great central valley that ran most of the length of California. There weren't tall mountains there, but I supposed if the canyon walls were forbidding enough, they didn't have to be that high. It was well placed, not too far from either the gold fields or the Mexicano border. That sounds ideal. Too ideal, in fact. Why isn't somebody already living there? Somebody was. A farming family. But they were slaughtered by Indians a few months ago. Burned most of their house. Set fire to their fields. Since then, no whites have dared to take it over. It's just sitting there for the taking. And what about the Indians? They could return. It's true. But if they did, they wouldn't find a peaceful farming family, would they? (laughs) I believe we could encourage them to seek easier targets. How far from here? Two-day ride if we hurry. Or three if we dawdle. Or if we find someone to rob on the way. Well, we always have to allow time for that. I took a last look at the magnificent beast at the far side of the barbed wire. Let's hurry. The ride north was rushed, across country, hammered by the sun. But when Carrillo showed us the canyon he described, I thought it all worthwhile. It was even better than he said. The entrance to the canyon was barely wider than the span of three horses, standing nose to tail. 
but the walls roll steep and sheer around it, forming natural barriers to anyone who might want to bypass that narrow opening. Sitting in a huge, grassy meadow inside the canyon were the remains of the farmhouse, partially burned, but stone walls and a chimney still stood, offering at least some shelter from the elements. Tall cottonwoods shaded the house, adding to its appeal. Whatever crops they had been growing had been well and truly torched, which didn't bother me much as I had no interest in farming. I was more interested in the thick, healthy grass, which would feed stolen horses until they could be marketed. Water trickled down the cliffs from a hidden spring and ran across the canyon. Riding close to Tres Dedos, I indicated a stretch of land toward the rear of the canyon. We can plant posts there and run fences between them. They'll keep the horses pent up, but nobody passing by would see them. And if they come into the canyon, they'll have other problems to worry about. Tres Dedos nodded and pointed to the tops of the cliffs on either side. We can station men at the high ends. From up there, they'll be able to watch anyone approaching well before they got close. If they can get up there, we can find some who are good climbers. They can affix knotted ropes to trees or brush at the heights. And then we'll have ladders up and down. But no one approaching from the outside will be able to do the same without being seen. Good idea. It's a natural fortress. Let's hope we don't need one. If we don't, then we're lacking in ambition. <laughs> The moon painted the valley with silver. The buzz, whine, and chirp of insects filled the air. Tres Dedos and I and four others moved slowly across the grass because the racket stilled when we approached and we didn't want to alert the men around the dying fire to our presence. But we were in no hurry. The night was long and the later it got, the sleepier our intended targets would be. Already two had left the fire and curled up to sleep, their snores soon adding to the general din that left two awake, smoking and talking softly. Four horses were tethered nearby, seemingly asleep on their feet. After a while, Gregorio Lopez leaned toward me and whispered, I can get them both from here. Two quick shots. Easy. Lopez was the best marksman of the group. Two men outlined by glowing embers would be child's play for him. No, I want to avoid any shooting until we're done. We didn't know how many other men might be scattered around, though two days and nights of observation hadn't revealed any significant numbers. The ranch boasted plenty of hands but few stayed out on the range with the livestock. Still, the sound of gunfire on a quiet, windless night might travel far enough for those in the bunkhouse to hear. I didn't want to bring them running. We worked our way closer until we were less than 20 feet away when one of my men stepped on something that made a sharp cracking sound. Instantly, the two men at the fire shot to their feet. Who's there? The man who'd spoken held the rifle loosely in his hands, but didn't know where to point it. I didn't move, didn't breathe. I held out one hand to keep the other still. The rifleman's companion sounded anxious. Just one of them hours, maybe. I don't like it. I spread my arms and my men responded by putting some space between us, moving ever so quietly but the two at the fire were on alert. Both had guns out, and they weren't going to relax now. One was already nudging the sleeping men with his foot, waking them. This wasn't going according to plan. Go! At my command, all six charged toward the fire from different directions. The men on their feet fired blindly. The other two threw back blankets and grabbed for weapons. Too late, though. 
My men closed the gap in moments, knives out. My bowie knife slashed the man with the rifle across his forearm. He cried out and released the gun, and I closed on him, driving the knife into his gut again and again. Hot blood splashed my hand and chest, and the man tried to claw my face until weakness overtook him. Beside me, Tres Dedos had grabbed the other gunman from behind and drawn his machete across the man's throat. The other two hadn't even found their footing before they were swarmed, overwhelmed. Before the last of the ranchers was killed, I gave the orders to spare his life. He bled from his wounds on his arms and chest, but he would live. Take his weapons. My men obeyed, checking the fallow for hitting guns or knives. Then Lopez and Pancho Dominguez hauled him to his feet. He was afraid, but he tried to put on a brave face. Who are you? What do you want? Just these fine horses. We mean you no harm. The man eyed his fallen companions. Don't look that way. You would have objected to our taking your livestock. We couldn't have that. You'll have half the county on your trail before sunrise. Those shots were heard for miles. Perhaps. It's a chance I'll take. The man studied me and my companions in the moonlight. When he recognized Tres Dedos, his mouth dropped open. You're Three Finger Jack. So I am. You've heard of him. Everyone's heard of him. He's a man killer. You honor me. I gestured at the man's chest with my knife and told him to strip. What? You heard me. Take off your clothes. My, my, my clothes? You asked a lot of questions for a man whose life I've just spared. Off with them. The man shrugged and unbuttoned his shirt. He was still bleeding and the fabric stuck to his wounds. He winced when he pulled it away. Keep going. You ain't never seen a naked man before? Don't make me change my mind about sparing you. If you want to live, strip and shut your mouth, quickly. The man kicked off his boots, dropped his outer shirt and his cotton undershirt on the ground, then shed his pants. He was lean, rangy, his arms and legs crisscrossed with scars. You've had a hard life. Who hasn't? Now the drawers. For real? You're not chasing us. If you want to run for the bunkhouse, you can. But it'll hurt. The fellow shrugged again and yanked off his drawers, tossing them aside. You like that? Liking has nothing to do with it. Boys. Load his weapons and clothing onto their horses. It's time to go. Dominguez had gathered their horses. He was a veteran of the American War and knew a lot about horses and other military matters. He and Lopez stashed the weapons of all four men, along with the naked rancher's clothes, and then all six of us mounted up. I leaned out of my saddle toward the man. I am Joaquin Murrieta. One day you'll tell your grandchildren about this. I glanced down at the man's exposed groin. That is, if any woman would be interested in a man with such little to offer. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing, I pulled out a pistol and fired two shots in the air. Paused a moment, then added a third. At the signal, men stationed at the fences knocked down two sections to create an opening. Other men, mounted, rode in and circled around the ranch's horses, whooping and firing guns, herding the horses toward the opening. The others and I joined in. Stampeding animals in the dark was always dangerous, but it wouldn't be dark for much longer. Besides, these animals were pure profit. If we lost a few, we were still out nothing but time and effort. By the time the sun crested the eastern mountains, our band was racing north, hooves thundering across hard-baked earth and raising a dust cloud that could be seen for miles. Others were in pursuit, their own cloud visible in the distance. I had planned for that too. Eighteen of my men were with me, herding the horses toward Arroyo de Cantua, 
12 more waited at a place where the pass narrowed and crossed a shallow river. The horses charged through, but when the pursuers reached it and slowed, even if only slightly, crossfire from the heights would cut them down and discourage any survivors. Keeping 30 men happy and earning enough wealth to ensure their continued loyalty was a challenge. But I was sure that even if we wound up with only 50 of these fine horses, the quality of the animals would fetch high prices. Those profits would be shared equally, with some left over to be donated to the impoverished Mexicanos around the state. This was my biggest victory yet and it was sure to be talked about for months, if not years. And that, as much as the treasure itself, was the point. Once their brands were altered and the horses sold, I took my share of the money and visited a tailor I'd heard about in San Jose. I left resplendent in the first things I'd ever worn made just for me. Still favoring black to enable me to disappear into the shadows. My shirt was elaborately embroidered and fitted with silver buttons. Over it, a black vest had plenty of pockets for anything I might need to carry. And I had an embroidered black coat to go over that. My pants were snug, the outer seams lined with silver conches. I continued my habit of wrapping a scarlet sash around my waist. Eating lunch, I noticed that an earlier diner had abandoned some newspapers on a nearby table. I picked up a copy of the El Dorado Republican and spotted a story about the horse theft. Halfway down, I found a almost familiar name. Joaquin Marietta? Some reports from Murphy's diggings speculate that this is the same man responsible for more than a dozen vicious murders in the spring, including the brutal beheading of the town's marshal. Marietta. I scowled at that. Somehow, I had to let people know who I was. I wanted Americans to scare their children with tales of my doings. As I walked back to the hotel, an aroma grabbed my attention and I followed it to a Mexican bakery called Molineras. When I entered, the sights and scents of pan dulce, tres leches cakes, bolillo, empanadas, cookies, tortillas, and more whisked me back to Mexico. A sweaty man behind the counter, his forehead and arms dusted with flour, was putting something into an oven with a large wooden paddle. In the front of the shop, a shorter woman filled the customer's order with a smile. She raised her head and greeted me. This place smells fantastic. What would you like? One of everything. (laughs) Do you want to eat it all here or take it with you? Before I could answer, another woman stepped into view from around a corner, carrying a basket of breads. She was considerably younger than the other two and very beautiful. Her eyes were light brown, almost the color of cinnamon, and sparkled with intelligence. Hair like flowing honey was pulled back in a braid that dropped almost to her waist. When her gaze met mine, She glanced away, then returned my look. Sir? The shopkeeper asked. I'd forgotten where I was for a moment. I hadn't been with the woman since Rosita's death. I couldn't stop myself from saying hello. The young woman froze, suddenly aware that I was addressing her. When she spoke, her accent had traces of Mexico in it. But that was all. Good afternoon. My mother asked you a question. Your mother? The young woman nodded her head toward the older one, still waiting at the counter for my order. I looked her way for an instant, but my gaze returned to the younger woman almost instantly. I'm Joaquin Murieta, and you are Antonia 
Molinera. She gave me a brief curtsy and set down the basket. The shopkeeper cleared her throat. My daughter, my pleasure to meet you. I was drawn in by the aroma, but I was rendered speechless by your loveliness, but obviously not speechless. Antonia's voice was stern, but the smile never left her eyes. She was perhaps a few years older than me, but something in her carriage, the planes of her face, and her sly smile suggested that she was far more worldly. Of course, I was no longer the innocent boy I had been when I'd wed Rosita and run away to America. Once again, the shopkeeper intruded on my thoughts. Senor, what would you like today? My daughter is not on the menu. My stomach was no longer the part of my anatomy on my mind, but I had to buy something or the woman would throw me out. Her basket, her basket is not for sale. Everything in it then, everything and the basket, but only if she will bring it to me. The shopkeeper studied me. I was glad I was wearing new tailored clothes and hoped she didn't pay attention to my beat up boots and hat. For the most part, I looked like a well-to-do gentleman. The shopkeeper opened her mouth to protest, but her daughter spoke first. Of course, it'll be the biggest sale of the day. Add it up, mother. Antonia picked the basket up off the work table and carried it toward me. At the counter, she did a half spin that ended with an aggressive thrust of her hip, and she stopped before me, holding the basket at her waist. Delicious. My gaze left no doubt that I didn't mean the breads. I'm sure you'll find them so. My father's the best baker in San Jose. I'm glad I happened into a shop then. And I do have a taste for baked goods. Is that all? Oh, no. I have a fondness for many of life's pleasures. Perhaps I could see you sometime and we could discuss them. I hardly know you, but the chaperone if you wish. Still, Senor Molinera, might I have the privilege of accompanying the young lady? The baker looked up from his work, kneading dough on a table. The girl knows her own mind. Then I have your blessing. Shall she agree? She's been her own creature for years now. If she agrees, she agrees. I turned back to Antonia. She still wore that smile, but I couldn't tell if it spoke of interest or merely patience. A walk then, when I know you better, not before. But how will you get to know me? She ticked her head toward the basket of breads. When you finish those, you'll need more. You're listening to Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Blood and Gold is a Realm production in association with Stryker Entertainment. Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Blood and Gold stars Richard Cabral, based on the novel Blood and Gold, The Legend of Joaquin Murrieta, by Jeffrey J. Marriott and Peter Murrieta, Produced by Marco Palmieri, Fred Greenhalge, Kaylin West, and Haley Wagreich. Adapted for audio by Greg Cox. Directed by Fred Greenhalge. Executive produced by Molly Barton, Marcy Wiseman, Russell Binder, Peter Murrieta, Julian Yap, and Richard Cabral. Historical notes read by Elena Ray. Spanish dialogue translated by Alana Grafham. Regional Dialect Coaching by Luis Armando Mercado Campos. Sound Design by Eric Mooney. Mixing, Mastering, and Additional Sound Design by Rory O'Shea. Audio Editing by Corey Barton. Original Score by Juan Carlos Enriquez. Music Supervision by Marcus Bagala. Production Manager, Alexis Latshaw. Production Coordinator, Angela Yi. Casting by Sunday Bowling and Meg Mormon. Cover Art by Kendall Thomas. Executive in charge for Realm, Mary Asadolahi. 
Find more shows like Blood and Gold by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm.